This video is an introduction to making forecasts in R based on time series models. And we're going to build on what we've been learning over the last few weeks, uh, building time series models based on the portal project data. And so let's go ahead and get set up by uh, loading a package and importing the data to work with. The package that we're going to load is the forecast package. So let's go ahead and type library parentheses forecast. This is one of the major packages for doing forecasting in R, in particular forecasting based on time series models. And then we need to load in the data that we've been modeling. And so just like the last couple of weeks, we'll say uh, data is equal to read.csv and then the name of the data set that we're loading. And that's our portal time series uh, .csv table down here. The next thing we need to do is make the date an actual date column in R. And so we can say data dollar sign date is equal to as dot date, data dollar sign date. And then we give it the format, which is equal to percent %m percent %d percent capital Y for the two digit month, the two digit day, and the four digit year. And then the last thing that we need to do to get set up is create our NDVI time series object. And so we can say NDVI underscore TS, that's what we're gonna name this time series object. We create that time series using the TS function, like before. We then tell it the column from our data frame that we want to use. So that's data dollar sign NDVI. We then need to give it the start date for the time series. And that's this vector with the year, 1992, and the month. It starts uh, in March. We then uh, also need to add an end date, which is going to be 2014 in November. And then we need to give it the frequency. Uh, and this is monthly data, so the frequency is 12. We've got 12 points uh, per year. And I'm missing a comma. There we go. So now we can see we've got our time series object uh, with 273 samples in it. During our last lesson, we talked about the six major steps in developing a forecast. The first two of those were problem definition and gathering information. And we're going to assume that we've done those already. The third was exploratory analysis, and that's basically what we've been doing for the last few weeks. And so we've done things like look at data structures, doing stuff like by plotting the time series itself. So plot NDVI underscore TS so that we got graphs looking like this one, where we could see what was going on in the time series. And we also uh, use the autocorrelation function. To figure out 
uh, what the structures were in the time series in terms of autocorrelation. We saw there were uh, a couple of short time scale correlations at one and two months, uh, as well as annual and even every two year uh, correlations picking up on seasonality at the site. The fourth step was choosing and fitting models, and that's what uh, we worked on during the last R tutorial. And in particular, we started with a simple model uh, that looks like this, uh, which is a white noise or a naive model. And this says that the uh, value, our NDVI at this, in this case, at time t, is equal to some constant, the average, the long-term average, plus some noise, some error at that time step. Uh, and we had error defined as uh, normally distributed with a mean of zero and some standard deviation. Now, last time you fit this with a function called mean f, we're actually going to switch over to using the ARIMA function, even just for fitting uh, this simple model, because it'll make making forecasts a little easier. <clears throat> and so to do that, we'll name this avg underscore model for just that average or white noise model. And then we're going to say this is equal to, and now we're going to use the ARIMA function like we used for more complicated models last time. We're going to fit it to the NDVI time series data. But since we just want this simple uh, naive model that we've been looking at that doesn't have any autoregressive or integration or moving average information, we're going to provide it with a model structure that has none of that. And so we're going to say uh, a vector here and then zero autocorrelation, zero integration, and zero moving average components. So this is going to do the same thing as mean f. We're just calculating the mean of the time series and the variance around it, uh, but we're going to fit it using the ARIMA model to make it easier to forecast. And so if we look at the structure of this average model, we can see we've got two components, the coefficient, which is C in our equation, and sigma squared, uh, which is the sigma value uh, in our equation, but squared. So now we've reviewed step three uh, and step four in the model development process, our exploratory analysis, and then uh, building and fitting models. And so now we can move on to step five, making forecasts. And to do that using time series data, we ask the time series model what it would predict uh, at some time step or time steps in the future. And to do this with the average model, all that we actually need to know is C, right? There's no time in here, really. So we just need to know uh, that long-term average NDVI. So how do we do this in R? We want to create an object or a variable to store our forecast in. So we'll call this average forecast. And then to generate the forecast, we use the forecast function. And then we provide it the model that we created. And so this, on its own, will actually generate forecasts from our current model. And generally, running forecast on a model will give us some predictions uh, for any model that we can put in here. If we look at what's in that forecast, once we've made it, 
we'll see uh, that there's a number of different pieces of information uh, in this forecast object. We have information on the method used for making the forecast, so it's showing us uh, the model that was being used. It's got information on the fitted values for that model, so what are the parameters of the model, uh, the coefficient and sigma squared, And if we look down here uh, far enough to this line that says mean, that's actually where the mean values or the expected values for the forecast are being stored. And these values are all the same, and that's because there's no real time series dependence, so it's actually just showing us the mean and DVI, and it's saying that's the forecast for every step because that's all the information that the model has. If we wanted to access those predictions then, we can pull them out uh, by going into our average forecast object, typing the dollar sign, and using mean to extract that chunk of data. And so there we can now see uh, laid out in a time series all of the predictions, uh, which are all exactly the same, and just the mean of NDVI. And you can see that we've got uh, 24 time steps worth of forecasts here. Uh, the default value is going to be basically two uh, seasons for forecasting, and so since we have uh, monthly data, we get out 24 predictions. We can change that if we want to uh, using an optional argument uh, in the forecast function. And so we could say average forecast is equal to forecast, again, of the average model. But now let's ask it to give us uh, 48 time steps into the future. So do four years instead of two. And now if we look at that vector of predictions uh, that's stored as mean, we'll see uh, that now uh, we have a full four years of, of forecasts instead of just two. We can then visualize these forecasts to see how they look compared to our data. And so let's go ahead and start by plotting the data itself. So we can say plot NDVI time series. And then we can add our forecasts to this plot using the function lines. So that's going to add a line plot to our graph. And we want that to be the average forecast and its mean vector, the prediction that it's made. And let's set color equal to uh, pink. And so now we can see that so far we've got our real time series, which is uh, very dynamic. And then our predictions, which are just flat, because they're just the long-term average, and they're here at the end. And we can make these kinds of graphs ourselves if we want to, but we can actually take advantage of the fact that the forecast package will do it for us automatically. And it's done this by overriding the base R plot function. And so if we, instead of plotting pieces of the forecast object, we just plot the forecast object itself. So we'll say plot avg underscore forecast. We'll actually get a nice looking graph like this that shows us the historical time series, the 
forecasts for future points in the time series, as well as some information uh, on the uncertainty of those forecasts that we'll talk about in just a minute. And it also includes information on the model that was used to make these forecasts. If you prefer ggplot to base R for graphing, the forecast package has us covered there as well. Uh, and we can do this using the function autoplot instead of plot. And then again, avg underscore forecast. And if we run that, we'll get out the same basic graph, but made using ggplot instead of base R. So we know what this line is, right? That's our long-term average NDVI, which at the moment is our forecast because it's just C in our model. What's going on with these blue uh, regions here? And this is information on uncertainty. And this is really important in forecasting because we need to know how confident we are in our forecast. Is the NDVI definitely going to be exactly this number uh, in a year? Or is it on average that number, but it could range anywhere from 0 to 1? Those are very different kinds of forecasts. And so these shaded areas provide that information. Based on how we've built this model so far, this is only variation caused by that uh, epsilon term in our model right here. Uh, it is not, does not include any variation in parameters. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, what that means uh, a bit more next week. And by default, this uh, set of values is the 80% uh, prediction interval. That's the inner box. Uh, and then the 95% prediction interval for the outer box. And the prediction interval uh, is where we would expect uh, that proportion of real values to fall. And so if we say the 80% prediction interval is this blue box, we expect 80% of the points during this forecast window, 80% of the empirical points during this period to fall within that box. And we expect 95% of the points during that forecast period to fall uh, in the light blue box. We can change uh, those forecasts, those prediction intervals uh, in our model if we want to. And we do that with another optional argument. Uh, so I'm going to go up here and add another optional argument, uh, which is level. And then we can set that equal to a vector. And then we can give it those prediction intervals that we want. We can include as many as we want. We'll stick with two here. Let's make it a 50% interval. So where's the range that we expect the values to fall half of the time? And the 95% prediction interval. And if we rerun that line and then remake our plot, we'll see that we have a narrower window for the inside box because it's going to contain just 50% of empirical points uh, and then the outer box stays the same. So what do you think about uh, this 95% uh, prediction interval just looking at the historic data? Do you think it's actually going to contain 95% of the points uh, in this forecast window? I'm a little skeptical myself, right? There's an awful lot of points up here around 0.35 or even 0.4, uh, and they don't seem like they would get captured here by this model. But how do we actually tell 
how do we figure out whether or not the uncertainty uh, in our forecast is working well? And that's something that we'll come back to uh, in the next tutorial when we talk about how to evaluate forecasts. So that's the basic idea behind how we make a forecast, and now we want to start building them with more complicated time series models. If you'll remember from last time, uh, we had also started to work with ARIMA models that incorporated information on the previous time steps, this autocorrelation for making predictions. And here's the non-seasonal ARIMA model that we ended up developing last time, where uh, the NDVI at time t was equal to some constant plus a coefficient times the NDVI at time t minus 1. So if we knew the NDVI at the last time step, we know something about the NDVI uh, at the next time step, plus another coefficient times y at t minus 2. So there's also some information going back two time steps, uh, plus some normally distributed error. And if you remember, we fit that model using the auto.arima function. And so we could say create uh, a model, arima model, which is equal to auto.arima. We're fitting that to the NDVI time series data object. And then we're setting seasonal equals to false. So that was how we fit that model. And now, uh, why don't you hit pause, take a break, and uh, make a forecast uh, yourself, including uh, this resulting graph for this uh, non-seasonal ARIMA model. Welcome back. Hopefully you got that working. Uh, what I would have done here is I would have said arima underscore forecast is equal to forecast from the arima model. And then having run that, we could then plot the resulting forecast. And we get a graph uh, like this one. And so how is this forecast actually working? The way that an ARIMA-based forecast works is it forecasts one step into the future at a time. And so for the first time step in the forecast, it's going to look at the last time step that was in the observed data, and it'll treat that as y at t minus 1. And then it'll go one time step back to get y at t minus 2. And then it'll do the calculations from the model, from the equation that we've been looking at, and make the prediction for the next time step. And so we can see that the model uh, seems to be working. Uh, the first time step back, y at t minus 1, has a strong positive influence. Uh, and so the value that we see showing up here uh, is above the mean. If you'll remember the second parameter in our two time step autoregressive model is actually negative. And so uh, this value has a negative influence, but it's a smaller uh, negative influence, and so uh, it's still positive. And then this model iterates, and so for the second prediction, it treats the first prediction as y at t minus 1, and the last observed value at y at t minus 2, and makes a prediction from there. And then for the third and following predictions, it looks at the last prediction 
and the next to last prediction for y at t minus 1 and y at t minus 2. And what you end up seeing in models like this is that they will gradually revert to the mean. So those betas are less than 1, and so eventually the influence of these previous time steps decays, and we end up reverting back to the mean value. But we do get a reasonable amount of realistic time series structure showing up before that happens. Now let's go back and look at the best model uh, that we had uh, when we were fitting and comparing models to one another, the seasonal ARIMA model. Remember that it didn't fit a lot better when we looked at its fit to historical data. And so then the question is, will it be basically the same when it comes to forecasting, or will it give us something more realistic? We can do that using our same code here, but let's go ahead and write it out again. Uh, so we'll call this the seasonal ARIMA model. We're going to fit that again using auto.arima on our NDVI time series. And seasonality will be built in automatically, so we can leave that alone. We can then create a seasonal ARIMA forecast using our forecast function. We're going to forecast based on the seasonal ARIMA model that we just fit to the data. But now let's go ahead and change a couple of things. Let's forecast 36 months into the future, three years. So we'll say H is equal to 36. And then let's change our prediction intervals uh, to, let's say, so we're going to say level is equal to a vector. And let's use the 80% uh, prediction interval and the 99% prediction interval. So that should give us almost uh, the entire set of possible states uh, for the outcomes. And we'll run that. Uh, and then we can go ahead and plot this seasonal ARIMA forecast. And if we do this and look at the output, we can see that it's actually a much more realistic looking forecast. It goes up and down in the same way that we tend to see in our historical forecast, and some of that makes sense in terms of seasonality. We should see green up uh, during some times of the year. And the range of our prediction intervals, at least at the top, also look more realistic. We've actually got spikes that are up in the range of the high spikes we've seen before for the 99% prediction interval. But there are also things that clearly still maybe don't look very good because uh, we've got a whole bunch of data that we'd expect to be showing up down here uh, in these parts of the prediction interval. And it seems unlikely based on the historical data that we're going to see values below 0 0.1. How do we actually tell whether this is a good forecast or not is something uh, that we'll get into in our next R tutorial. Uh, right now, it just looks a bit more realistic. So that's the basic idea behind how to make forecasts for time series data and time series models using R. We start by fitting a time series model to the data. And then once we've done that, we can use the forecast function from the forecast package to make forecasts for future values. Those forecasts depend on the details of the time series model, uh, but will often be composed of a series of one step ahead forecasts where 
the first time step in the future is forecast, and then that forecast is used as part of helping predict the next time step in the future, and so on.